So it's 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time for our discussions to join the, the panel. Thank you very much to, uh, to both of you. So I would like to call Joan Dragos Tudorache, Tamas Molnar, and Kadri Sova. So we are delighted to have um, representatives uh, of three institutions um, and actors who are directly involved um, from different perspectives in this domain. Um, we will start. We will start with uh, uh, Jan uh, Dragos. Uh, we are delighted to count with his participation, uh, head of unit. Uh, C1, not an easy topic to head, uh, irregular migration and return policy at DG Home, uh, European Commission. Uh, he has long standing experience in DG Home, and um, we are very much looking forward to hearing from, from him um, comments also on this issue and also to learn what the Commission is, is uh, doing, planning to do in this respect. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Um, Good morning to everyone. Let me start first by uh, saying that research such as the one that is launched today, uh, and which is the basis for the discussion this morning, is uh, research that is very much needed and that we very much welcome. It may sound counterintuitive, but it's not. Uh, and in fact, um, it is this kind of research that strengthens quite a lot uh, some of the underlying reasons uh, in the evaluation that we have conducted last year for the facilitators package. In fact, what our evaluation had found at the time was that there was not enough of this research at the time. There was not enough data. There was an insufficient information as to what are, in fact, the realities on the ground. And now, with all the attention uh, that uh, this particular topic has received uh, in the last two, three years, this research is coming more and more forcefully. And again, it can only enrich and it can only give us the elements that we need to decide better on the next steps to take. Furthermore, what this research brings, and I think it was evident also from the presentations that were uh, done already, is the diversity of situations, the diversity of challenges that are being faced on the ground by civil society actors, as well as by those on the side of the authorities who are having to deal with this phenomenon, whether it's judicial practitioners, whether it's law enforcement practitioners, whether it's the authorities at the local or regional level that have to somehow handle bits and pieces of this phenomenon. And is this diversity, and if we take, and a few examples have already been highlighted, if we take Italy and search and rescue situations in the Mediterranean, if we take Greece and the kind of cases that have arisen from there, if we take the Serbian-Hungarian border, if we take Calais, or if we take Ventimiglia, uh, the situations are very different. The challenges that are being faced, again, by all this array of actors are also very different. And again, it's this diversity that would be very difficult to capture, or at least that we have found last year and the evaluation and the, and the uh, organization that has conducted the evaluation last year have, has found very difficult to capture in order to be able to uh, decide on whether new legislation was necessary or new uh, intervention at policy or legislative level. I think the other element that is being brought up by this research and by the discussions and presentations is the complexity. It is a very complex phenomenon, human smuggling, and again, we've heard uh, the presentation of, of Luigi. I couldn't agree more. There are many, many blur lines, uh, many blur lines between who the, uh, the uh, clients of migrant smuggling are, a lot of blurred lines between who the smugglers themselves are, and a lot of blurred lines, let's be honest, and it comes out of the discussion between what is happening once migrants are getting close to our borders and what are the type of situations and the type of interventions that are being conducted to respond to those situations. So again, out of this complexity, uh, we can only draw the conclusion that rushing with legal definitions is not necessarily something that would be bringing more clarity. And again, this was the second finding of our evaluation last year, and also the second reason 
why our choice at the level of the European Commission last year was not to put forward any change of legislation at the time and for the time being, because again, it would have been a piece of legislation that would not have been sufficiently informed, that would not have had sufficient evidence based uh, to be able to uh, have some guarantees that it would actually be producing the results that we all expect of it. Any new criminal legislation, whether it's in this area or in any other area, comes in itself with an initial unsettling period. When practitioners have to get used, understand, learn, develop practices, ways in which to deal with new elements of a crime, with new elements of how you investigate a crime, and migrant smuggling is no different. I would say, in fact, migrant smuggling is even more complex and difficult than any other forms of new criminality because of the complexity that I mentioned earlier. And the complexity does not only come from the definition itself, and also, and you have uh, raised it, I think, yourself, and you have looked at it during your research. Uh, you have the, the UN uh, definition, you have the EU definition, and then in itself, the many elements that, that, that form this crime uh, are giving quite a lot of uh, a challenge to our practitioners. But again, these kind of challenges, any time you come with new criminal legislation, are sorted by jurisprudence. It is usually not by new legislation or by adding new uh, legal complexity on top of one that is already there that you actually bring in clarity to the phenomenon or to how the authorities respond to it. It is usually jurisprudence. It is the intervention of our court systems. And we are, thank God, living in a union that is still governed by the rule of law, generally. Um, and it is those courts that, with their jurisprudence, are, with every case they, they run, they are providing those elements of clarity, and they are bringing uh, that certainty as to how a particular concept of a particular type of intervention would be dealt with, uh, would be treated, would be labeled, would be considered uh, either criminal or not. And if we look at those cases that very few Unfortunately, still very few, or fortunately, because there aren't many, but in terms of clarifying the legal concepts, if we look already at the few uh, rulings of the courts, uh, and if I only take the ruling of last week, I think it was in the Proactiva case, it does show that courts, working with the legislation as it stands, both the one at EU level as well as the one at national level, are making those judgment calls, which they are supposed to make. They are entitled to make, and they are bringing that clarity, even where the investigators at the beginning maybe were not that clear about how to interpret or how to label a particular type of behavior. So my first message would be that at the current state of affairs, the underlying assumptions in our conclusion not to bring forward new legislation still stand. <laughs> However, we did evolve in terms of diversity of, of knowledge, diversity of research, number of cases since last year, and that is, again, in reaching our understanding of the phenomenon. And on our side, we want to go further with that, again, to be able to grasp even better uh, what's going on. But I will come to that at the end. Now, very quickly, I'd like to, to go through some of the issues that were raised uh, during the first presentations. Uh, I'll start with the question that you started with, uh, Sergio, and also that was, was uh, raised, uh, I think, in one of the interventions, which is, who are the smugglers? Are they the mafia style, as you call them, um, criminals, or are they the more blurred half-migrant, half-smugglers uh, that uh, Luigi mentioned? Let me say that from all of the discussions that I've witnessed in the European Council or in the Justice and Home Affairs Council, there is not a single shred of doubt in the minds of our political leadership as to who the smugglers are that they are referring to when they write those council conclusions. They are referring to the criminals. 
And I think we should not make the mistake of believing that those criminals do not exist or that mafia-style criminal networks do not exist. They do exist. Maybe they are not on our territory, and this is where I think I do have a lot of understanding for our judicial practitioners, the law enforcement practitioners who find themselves difficulty in dealing and prosecuting and investigating these crimes, because indeed, for the reasons of complexity that I mentioned at the beginning, they are not easy crimes to prosecute. The jurisdiction where the, these or most of these activities are taking place are not their own jurisdiction, another jurisdiction of our prosecutors or of our law enforcement officials. These criminal networks, they operate outside, or most of them operate outside of our territories or the territories of our member states, and that makes it indeed very difficult for uh, our prosecutors and for law enforcement officials to deal with them. And the solution, we believe, uh, I, I think it was also mentioned here, that we are uh, following more the people than we are following the money. No. Our investigators, uh, Europol, with the uh, law enforcement uh, agencies in the member states, they are following the money. Because they are understanding, and that also shows that, in fact, the focus of the operational response that they're trying to give is uh, towards those criminal networks and not towards those situations where indeed the roles might be blurred. So again, that would be my first message on this question of who are the smugglers, not to make the mistake of believing that those criminal networks do not exist, because they do. And even worse so, and again, I'm speaking out of the experience of spending quite a lot of time on the ground over the last year in Niger, in Nigeria, there are very solid uh, evidence, there is very solid evidence that again, not only that these criminal gangs exist, but these same criminal organizations that are smuggling, uh, that are smuggling people across the desert are also smuggling weapons, are also smuggling uh, drugs, uh, are all even involved in uh, supporting terrorist organizations such as Boko Haram. So again, we have, I think, to be quite careful when we're trying to frame the phenomenon not to only look at one aspect of it, which is clearly there. Again, I'm not, I don't stand here to say that the, the typology of the phenomenon that we witness on our territories, on our borders or beyond our borders, where indeed roles might be, might be becoming blurred, again, should not be uh, mistaken for uh, what happens particularly in Africa or North Africa. Syria is a bit of a special case. And again, there, I think the lines are even more blurred in, than it is the case for, for Africa. But again, for the irregular uh, uh, migration routes that are crossing North Africa, there is a criminal uh, organization uh, element to it, and it should not be uh, disregarded. When it comes to the blurring of roles, um, I think there, again, I agree. There are contexts where these roles are blurred, and I think that makes definitions even harder to uh, provide. And again, that I think reinforces uh, the case that we should not be thinking that rushing to a definition of one sort or another would be solving the situation because again, those blurred lines uh, do, do exist. Addressing the demand, I fully agree. Uh, legal pathways and, and, and addressing root causes is and has to be part of the response and this is why we have always tried to balance the two. Difficulty of prosecuting smugglers, uh, I mentioned already. Um, unclear role, uh, false expectations out of our agencies or CSDP missions. Uh, I think with every refinement of the mandate of UNAF or MED or other CSDP missions, we have been trying to refine and clarify those mandates. And I don't think that it, when it comes to search and rescue, there is any unclarity, neither for, for Frontex nor for any CSDP. Uh, asset that is deployed uh, at the borders or in the Mediterranean, that search and rescue and saving lives is their top priority. Uh, when it comes to the uh, civil society uh, actors and NGOs and uh, the finding of uh, them um, perceiving uh, more policing against them as a result of the activities, I think this is a worrying trend. This is a f worrying phenomenon that indeed has to be looked into. If 
if the policies that <clears throat> either at the national or EU level we've been trying to put in place are producing that effect, this is something that we need to address. And now I come to my uh, conclusion and to a concrete uh, follow-up that we uh, have been aiming to put in place already for, for several months, again, in the face of, of mounting evidence and uh, more and more research and information coming forward to us. Um, we will, very soon, at the beginning of May, call for a first um, gathering, a first workshop of civil society actors, where we are going to try to put in place a more regular uh, systematic mechanism of consulting uh, with these actors, because we do want to start bringing all of this evidence that has amounted uh, until now to start bringing it to us uh, to inform the policy making um, that we uh, are prepared to make uh, again once that we uh, that we appropriate ourselves also with these uh, mounting cases and, and evidence. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Dragos. Um, I was just wondering. We, we started with the question: Who are the smugglers? And you said that in the JHA Council there seems to be a common understanding about that question. But perhaps the question, if I may should be rather who are not smugglers, uh, and they're who are really not uh, people who should not be considered as smugglers and criminals. And this is where the, there is a lot of potential for, for example, for the European Union to work more closely with the UN. Uh, you mentioned the protocol against the smuggling of migrants. I mean, we have, these are obligations for member states. These are UN obligations for member states, which tell us very clearly that uh, humanitarian assistance should be ex exempted. So why don't we see more upholding these common standards at EU level uh, and saying and very clearly stating who are not uh, smugglers um, also, uh, uh, you know, among, among the member states. I thank you very much also the question of funding. The European Parliament has a new values, uh, this idea of funding directly civil society, which is uh, uh, also towards that direction, uh, particularly in contexts, and it's not only Hungary, Poland, but in every member state, this is something that uh, will be of critical importance to uphold the role of NGOs. Um, so thank you very much for your views. Let's, ne uh, let's now move to uh, Tamas, Tamas Molnar. He's a legal researcher officer at the FRA in Vienna. The FRA has been doing fantastic work and research in this issue, uh, looking also previous reports on the facilitators uh, package. And uh, Tamas, we look forward to hearing your views. Thanks very much, uh, Sergio, and thanks the organizers for this kind invitation. It's my honor and privilege to be here and speak on behalf of FRAU on, on this issue of common interest. So, um, yeah, I work for the EU Fundamental Rights Agency, which is an independent EU agency uh, based in uh, uh, Vienna. And uh, we uh, have been dealing with this issue for a while, more uh, uh, precisely the non-criminalization of those uh, who engage with uh, uh, irregular migrants or who provide humanitarian assistance to irregular migrants uh, has been uh, on our research uh, agenda uh, for the last few years. It has materialized, for instance, in the publication of a report in 2014 entitled Criminalization of Migrants in an Irregular Situation and those or and of persons engaging with them. Uh, it is uh, free of charge, uh, uh, available, downloadable from FRA website as all of our uh, products. And um, more recently, we are now uh, finalizing our annual uh, fundamental rights report covering last year. These are annual uh, report, reports, uh, always looking at the, the, uh, the previous calendar year which has a chapter, as always, on migration and asylum, and it deals with, in a subsection, uh, the latest phenomenon of, of and latest developments of, of this uh, uh, specific uh, topic, criminalization or non-criminalization of, of uh, people uh, uh, dealing with irregular uh, migrants from humanitarian uh, perspectives. And in my now just remaining eight minutes, uh, I would like to uh, share with you some, some findings, uh, recent findings, uh, uh, which uh, can also speak to, to the 
uh, findings of the, of the research carried out by SEPs uh, in cooperation with MPC and other actors, more specifically uh, uh, to the paper uh, published by or, or written by SEPs researchers. My starting point would be to recall the evaluation of the EU facilitation package carried out by the Commission. The, the results uh, were published uh, last year, and this uh, evaluation found that there was no need to revise the, uh, the EU facilitation acquis, including the definition. But the report or this evaluation uh, uh, um, acknowledged that uh, some actors perceive a risk of criminalization of humanitarian uh, assistance. Uh, it is true that uh, there is limited evidence of prosecution and conviction of individuals or organizations uh, that facilitate irregular border crossing, transit and entry uh, uh, and stay for humanitarian reasons. But uh, individuals uh, uh, providing this kind of humanitarian assistance uh, are, are fearful, be them within member state territory at uh, border areas uh, or operating at the high seas. So uh, we, we can see this kind of uh, uh, you know, emergence of, of, of policing and other modalities as uh, uh, set out in the SAPS research paper like intimidation, suspicion, uh, and discipline. So those measures which do not amount to uh, criminal investigations but there are some threats by, by, by law enforcement authorities towards these people or NGOs. Uh, to strengthen legal clarity and uh, uh, to avoid uh, punishing these humanitarian actions, uh, as was already mentioned, the European Commission uh, recommended some, some actions to, to take. Uh, in this evaluation report, uh, uh, there's a, let's say, a follow-up measure uh, on enhancing the exchange of knowledge and good practices between prosecutors, uh, law enforcement, civil society, um, and also just to, to dig deeper and to understand better this, this phenomenon, not just you know, uh, uh, talking without solid evidence, but, but to, <laughs> to, to have this, this evidence from various uh, angles. And uh, the Commission also uh, plans to cooperate closely with, with FRA, uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency, and Eurojust in this uh, endeavor. Now, let me mention a few examples. Uh, first, some positive developments on the mem at the member state level, and then some negative ones. To start with, uh, in Croatia, uh, as of last July, the protection of humanitarian actors uh, improved with a change of legislation uh, introducing a safeguard clause. So now in Croatian law, there's uh, a humanitarian exception clause, uh, which is a, a, a really positive development, since in the past, uh, police indirectly threatened to pursue for migrant smuggling, volunteers and some NGO staff uh, who accompanied asylum seekers to, to police stations. And after the entry into force of this law, these practices stopped. So there's a clear shift in, in, in policy. When it comes to France, uh, you were just, uh, just uh, uh, published uh, uh, a case law analysis at the beginning of last year on uh, selected French court cases dealing with migrant smuggling from 1990 to 2016. And from this analysis, it's clear that only cases adjudicated before 2012 uh, concerned individual prosecuted for sheltering migrants without uh, papers, the so-called sans-papiers. 2012 was the, the point in time when uh, France introduced legislative changes accepting humanitarian actions from punishment. So it, it might be a good, good sign. And the last example from the Netherlands, where the law does not provide for a humanitarian exception, but nevertheless, the Dutch Supreme Court last year, I think it was May, so just one year ago, ruled that even uh, if uh, a migrant was brought into the, the Netherlands uh, in an unlawful manner, but the purpose of this was to avoid an emergency situation, to provide emergency health care, for instance, that constitutes a ground for not punishing a person who would otherwise be found guilty of migrant smuggling under the criminal code. So the apex court of, of, of the Netherlands recognized uh, 
a humanitarian exception. So even if it's not in written law, in jurisprudence, there is uh, such an exception. And I could also mention a, a court case from Greece. Uh, it's a lower uh, 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 court uh, which uh, acquitted a couple uh, who have been allegedly involved in not allegedly, who, who have been involved in uh, SAR operations, but allegations were put forward against them that it was like a smuggling-related activity, but the couple was, was finally, uh, uh, I mean, the, the charges have been uh, dropped. Then let's see some, some varying developments across uh, Europe, again, focusing on 2017. We all know these this, uh, areas where uh, uh, the acts of humanitarian assistance uh, have been, let's say, brought into spotlight uh, due to some threats and policing activities like the French-Italian border region. Just one example in Ventimiglia, which is an Italian border town, uh, three volunteers from an NGO were arrested for distributing food to irregular migrants. Since a local decree banned food distribution, so it was, formally speaking, uh, uh, an unlawful activity. Then. Similarly, the Paris Perfect banned food distribution outside the La Chapelle reception center, which led to uh, arrests uh, and fines for members of an NGO. Then Calais, we, we all know that even after this mantling of, of, the, of the informal camps, new camps have emerged, and uh, one charity organization uh, installed portable showers in the informal camp, re-emerging informal camp for homeless migrants, but then riot police came in, arrested one of, of these uh, uh, volunteers uh, on the ground of providing assistance to the illegal residents of foreigners. Finally, the charges have been dropped. But again, this policy, so we, we can see uh, these borderline uh, cases and, and the threat is clearly out there. Also, the SEPS paper uh, found out, and I think now it's, it's, it's uh, uh, common knowledge that uh, in the central Mediterranean, vessels deployed by civil society organizations uh, played an important role in search and rescue, especially in the first half of, of last year. Uh, nevertheless, allegations that some NGOs are or have been cooperating with smugglers in Libya prompted a shift in the perception of their contribution. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's clearly there. They first have been seen as positive actors because of the search and rescue activities. But it, it can easily change, especially in the eyes of, of the public opinion. Uh, but for instance, the Italian Senate, an authoritative body, uh, the upper uh, uh, house of the parliament, examined this issue in detail and dismissed such allegations. It found that NGOs were not involved, nor directly, uh, uh, neither indirectly in migrant smuggling. Nevertheless, it recommended some uh, coordination, better coordination between the, the players. Then, uh, because of time constraints, I will not talk about the action plan, uh, you know, after the developments last summer, uh, EU leaders uh, decided uh, uh, to, about the need to elaborate code of conduct uh, for, for NGOs working in the central Mediterranean, Italian authorities, uh, put together is a code of conduct, but uh, I will leave it. Just uh, to, to, to finish off uh, some other, let's say, aspects of, of, of the, of the uh, role and work of the NGOs working in the Central, Mediter Center, Center, Central Mediterranean. Um, Despite these findings I just mentioned by the Italian Senate, Italian authorities still took measures to address uh, uh, actions by NGO-deployed uh, vessels, which have been considered uh, exceeding the search and rescue uh, activities or, or uh, mandate. Two examples, let me mention two examples. Last August in Trapani, Italy, uh, a court ordered the seizure of, of, of a uh, rescue boat deployed by uh, the NGO Jugend Rettet, uh, so it, it's still an ongoing case. And last October, uh, the Italian police conducted a search on board of uh, uh, a ship deployed by Save the Children after an undercover agent uh, worked on the ship. So we have now these two pending cases. 
Uh, and these legal proceedings will have to deal with this delicate question of determining the scope of acts covered by the humanitarian clause, excluding punishment for, for uh, what would otherwise be deemed migrant smuggling. So here again, and, and I, I finish on this note, even if we have a clause on humanitarian exception, uh, the scope of it uh, depends much on the interpretation, which lies first and foremost in the hands of the, of the judges of the courts. Thanks very much, and I'm at your disposal for further questions. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for taking us through uh, your, the findings uh, of, uh, of the FRA. I mean, this question, we come back to this, um, some prosecutors, prosecutorial authorities charging people with a crime, and then the case being taken forward or not, but the damage is done. Uh, already. Um, so when politics get into judicial authorities, which are not independent, then uh, the question of uh, effective implementation, relying too much on those authorities to actually uh, deliver what is needed uh, is uh, very much uh, uh, at stake. Um, now, uh, next speaker is Kadri Sova. Bikum has been partner uh, also uh, in the SEPS project, and I would like to thank uh, really uh, Bikum for their contribution, and Michel Levois, who uh, con, you know, couldn't make it uh, with us today, the director of Bikum, and uh, Kadri uh, for their wonderful contribution. Kadri, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks a lot, Sergio. Um, first, let me just say thanks a lot to SEPS for picking up this issue. Um, we have always looked at SEPs um, for kind of, um, they, they always seem to be um, very visionary in terms of what the political mood is and what kind of research there is needed. Um, and I think when you started this, um, this research project, the issue was obviously on the, on the, on the table, um, but actually the, the, the kind of height that it has achieved now, it's, it's quite incredible that you really managed to, to be on the, on the wave of the political um, sentiment. So thanks a lot. Um, uh, I wanted to just maybe um, tell you a couple of thing, words kind of from a historical perspective as PICUM. So PICUM is a, a network of organizations working with and for undocumented migrants across Europe, but also in other world regions. We have 163 members as to now in 36 countries, but our main focus is Europe. Um, so what, uh, what I just wanted to kind of tell you is that we started off, PICOM started off in 2001 uh, as an organization of five, um, five very grassroots frontline organizations. And this issue has been at the heart of, of PICOM's work actually from the beginning. Um, PICOM looked at this specific issue in 2003 actually in its uh, some, uh, published um, reports called the Book of Solidarity, uh, which was actually written a year after the facilitation package where it rang some alarm bells um, and worried that the UN protocol wasn't actually implemented in full um, and gave some flavor of, of the criminalization um, that was going on at that time across Europe. Um, so it was an issue back then, um, but but it, it sort of died out. And I think what Mr. Tudorace said is very right. The, the, the courts have acted as a sort of a barrier up to now um, to, uh, to push back on attempts to politicize these, this um, and to over-criminalize um, these acts. Um, so it has, it has been quite, uh, quite quiet, let's say. We've heard from our members here and there, you know, attempts to, to, to criminalize, to prosecute, but, you know, normally they, it didn't get very far. Um, in the past five years, we've we started hearing it more and more and more. Um, and actually, um, kind of, the, the mood has changed a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit m more in depth. Um, so as a starting point, I just wanted to say that I think in 2002, it was, no, 2000, yeah, 2002, it was a huge missed opportunity um, to actually uh, put in place the facilitators directive with uh, uh, the requirement of material benefit um, and a very clear exemption uh, that would be obli obligatory for, for member states. So this is where we, we kind of um, uh, 
started with. Um, so fast forward to now, today, uh, the situations we are facing, also even when, when the Commission did the review a couple of years ago, I think we were facing still a little bit different situation. Um, so basically what we're looking at is the entry and stay, and these are two, two uh, different, um, I think quite, quite different but overlapping issues. Um, so on one hand, on the entry point, um, we do as well see from the civil society perspective um, a broadening of the smuggling concept. What we also feel is that there is somehow less stringent procedures when it comes to um, crimes linked to migration. Um, for example, this issue of material benefits. Um, we know that the prosecutors say um, it's very difficult to prove, um, you know, the burden of proof is, is, is so high. I totally agree. I understand. I, I understand where that is coming from, but yet, yet that, that, doesn't, um, that doesn't give ground to, to apply less stringent procedures. We see this, for example, as well with immigration detention. Um, you know, immigration detention, at the end of the day, it's, it's deprivation of liberty. And when you look at deprivation of liberty in other contexts, like pre-trial detention, or when you um, deprive somebody's liberty because they are dangerous to themselves or others, there's very, very stringent judicial procedures. And, and you know, every 48 hours, you, you have to seek new approval from the judge. Immigration detention, just totally different rules apply, even though it's the, actually the same um, the same restriction of, of freedoms. So we see that kind of in, in the background as well. We also see that um, prosecutors, I mean, if you talk to any prosecutors across Europe, they would tell you that they actually do feel massive political pressure to prosecute um, cases of human smuggling, so to apply uh, the, the, the articles and the, the, uh, of human smuggling. Um, a, a year ago or a couple of years ago, I heard from Germany that actually they had a first case where they tried to prosecute a situation where, um, where an NGO was giving a map to a group of migrants to cross a border. So they did in a company, they didn't do anything, but they just gave a map so at night they would be safer. There was actually a, somebody died on the way, so the NGO would... Uh, they tried to then prosecute um, the NGO. I haven't followed that case up, actually. I think it would be uh, interesting to see what happened there. Um, but as was said, um, the, the prosecutions go forward, but not a lot uh, comes out of it. Um, so that's on the, uh, on the, on the state level. However, um, I think the Commission and the EU is, is absolutely not without blame. I think the com communication line that has come out in the past years around smuggling is very disturbing. It's very, very problematic. A lot of the political pressure that we see for prosecutors actually comes from the EU level. Um, also, what, uh, what Lina was saying about the, the communication line of l following the money, you know, it's, it's a big, big bad spin <laughs> at the end of the day because there is no obligation to prove material benefit. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I think it's for, for um, academics to deconstruct the concept of smuggling and so on. Um, I wouldn't go into that. <coughs> but I do see that um, there has been a lot of talk and, and the smuggling has, has become such a big issue, yet we never hear about the actual numbers of prosecutions. We actually never really hear about the, the numbers of, of um, yeah, networks dismantled. Um, you know, we know why that is, because the numbers are very small. Because it is a very difficult and complex phenomenon, like you say. Um, now, quickly to, um, to the issue of stay. And this is actually the most problematic part that we feel and face in our networks and where I would really like to raise some alarm bells. Um, we see a lot of obstruction and harassment of NGOs, and this is increasing destruction of, of NGO property, um, uh, denying access to migrants. Um, it's this kind of constant uh, reminder that people and NGOs, civil society, are doing something illegal, something against the law, and it does have a huge impact on uh, public support. 
and it, this kind of feeling that any interaction with migrants is actually could be punished if the state only wants to. Um, and it, it might seem like nothing, and I know that it's very difficult to capture this in a, in a legislative document, but however, this is, um, this is the reality. And um, in particular, for example, the situation of Hungary now, um, and, and well, not only Hungary, but many populist narratives um, it's, it's the classic populist narrative of external enemy and the internal enemy, and the internal enemy has become now not only the migrants who are in the country, but also the people who assist and help them. And, and this, is, this tries to enter into the consciousness of people um, and justify a lot of actions that are outside of the, the scope of the facilitation directive. So for example, in Hungary, we see the, you know, the director of our member in Hungary um, whose children in school, the director is telling their children, do you know what your father does? And you know, this kind of harassment in schools. Um, and it's, it's now the regular people in society who are given the right to harass and to persecute people um, in society. So this, um, this is the kind of, um, let's say, distant impact. And I think the commission should find ways how to support also civil society who are losing funding uh, because we know that in Hungary, for example, now the, the, the government has stopped army funding and has told the commission that it's just a temporary situation. However, um, uh, it, civil society who are actually giving uh, assistance uh, or basically executing, implementing the AMIF uh, funds, they, they don't see this as a temporary thing. So I think there are measures that need to be put in place how to offer some sort of safety net in these very difficult situations. So thanks a lot, um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kadri. So it's time for you uh, to raise uh, questions or comments. Uh, please be brief and uh, introduce yourself. Um, so at the end of the room. Thank you. Doris Peschke, Church's Commission for Migrants in Europe. Thank you for the presentations. I was just wondering, there was so much emphasis on jurisprudence, um, doing things right then in the end, but it takes a long time. And for particularly NGOs uh, who then have to, during that time, find the money uh, also to pay lawyers rather than rescuing persons, for instance, in the case of the search and rescue operations, uh, or other um, assistance organizations, they have to do totally different things in terms of um, publicity, communication, legal assistance, than their uh, real purpose. So this shift is a real problem for many NGOs and the funding for that is a real issue. One of the questions is, are there ideas in the commission how that can be uh, perhaps also supported with a legal fund uh, for NGOs who are accused. Just the idea. Thank you, Doris. Any Can other question? Questions? Yes, let's gather some questions and then we'll come back to the panel and close the session, please. Uh, Julien Brachet from the University of Paris. Uh, two Excuse me, sorry? Julien Brachet, Julien Brachet. From Paris. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, for the head of the unit C1, uh, I prefer not to pronounce your name, Johan Dragos. Uh, first, you say something like uh, when our political leaders talk about smugglers, they talk about uh, criminals, and definitely, and kind of uh, mafia style smugglers or something like that. And I was wondering why, uh, wh what is the difference between this kind of mafia style smugglers and traffickers? Because you never use the word traffickers. And the second question is, um, you said that uh, there are evidence of the existence of, uh, against mafia-style smugglers in Niger, Nigeria, and uh, Northern Africa. And um, if this is the case, for how long have they been working in this part of Africa? Because I've spent a bit of time there, I've never seen anything like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two more questions. Good morning, my name is Reem Al Salim. I'm an independent humanitarian consultant and I wanted to follow up on the point that the previous speaker just made and 
on the very excellent point that uh, you made about the how we communicate about smuggling. In fact, uh, Mr. Douglas, when you talked about uh, the existence of a criminal enterprise and uh, trafficking networks, you depicted it very much as being sort of um, a network run by foreigners offshore uh, outside of Europe. So again, reinforcing this image that it's, it's really a threat that is coming from the outside. Isn't the reality much more complex than that? And isn't it that um, criminal, uh, it is such a profitable criminal enterprise that many criminal entities cooperate together, that it's uh, beyond uh, one continent, that it's transnational, that uh, there are many different heads and leaderships that collaborate. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I know, for example, that uh, any Nigerian uh, criminal networks that operate in Italy are very much working together with the Italian mafia and by protection from the Italian mafia. So there are European uh, criminal entities as involved uh, as uh, foreign entities. And I think it's very important that we draw out these nuances because it, it, it's important how uh, you know, it is understood by the public that, that this is also an issue where we are as Europeans, part of the problem, and, and therefore we need to tackle it inside our continent. Thank you very much. Next question, One last question. Hi, Alizé Doshi from University Saint Louis, Brussels. I have one quick comment and one question. The first comment is that I'm surprised that we don't speak about a uh, fishing uh, boat that have been uh, arrested in the past and in the case of the Central Mediterranean Road, the impact of the criminalization of fishership uh, uh, in, the, um, in the actual situation in the high sea. And my question uh, is about uh, some of the cases uh, of smuggling in Italy and uh, referring to the case of Ben Salem Khaled, who was uh, condemned for 20 years uh, prison for the, three, for the third uh, October shipwreck, or another uh, smuggler, uh, Mered, uh, that we still don't know if it's the, actual, the, the right person in jail or not in Italy. Um, can we consider that these cases have more the, 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 the aim to prevent irregular uh, migration smugglers to, to do this, to give visibility to, risk, to risks incurred by smugglers, than to really um, dismantle the networks? I mean, what is the real objective of this kind of condemnation? We are very pressed with time, so we're going to ask our, you know, our panel to rush through Yes, There's very you. simple questions. Yes, thank you very much for your questions. So, Dragos, you have first. Thank you. I'll start uh, first with the questions from the audience and then maybe go a bit through some of the issues that were raised also during your, your interventions. So, first issue of funding. Um, one of the uh, topics uh, of conversation with the uh, civil society actors and NGOs in the process that I announced we will start as of the beginning of May would be also that. Uh, so we'll be uh, looking forward to hear about the situation on that particular uh, front um, and if there are any particular mechanisms that we can think of putting in place to assist with that. At this very moment, I don't even have the data to know how much funding is there going at EU level or not to NGOs that are working on uh, these matters, but again, uh, I look forward to be further informed by the organizations themselves on this and what the needs would be. Second question, differentiation between smugglers and traffickers. I think the differentiation is, is, is very clear. In cases of trafficking, you also have the element of exploitation, which in the situation of smuggling, normally you do not. Uh, although even there, there may be blood lines, which is why uh, often you find the two mentioned in the one sentence, because also often, Sometimes the networks are the same, uh, and those that are also smuggling some are trafficking others. The issue is particularly acute when it comes to women, uh, when it comes to Nigerian women, and we all know of the networks and the uh, prostitution uh, uh, rings, particularly in, in Italy, and how they are being supplied by these criminal activities in Africa, which is why I said that there are criminal, and we should not be making the mistakes of thinking that there are no criminal organizations behind. There are. And here, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying uh, about the nature of the crime. 
I fully agree with everything you've said. Maybe I mistakenly uh, made believe that the, uh, the tentacles or the, the, the material manifestation of this crime only happens outside our territory. No, certainly there are also uh, ramifications inside the EU. And here I would link it, uh, because it was also raised by, by, uh, by your uh, questions, but also I think by some of the other interventions, which is the issue of prosecutions and how do our leaders, uh, what do they want, our leaders, uh, and also the political pressure that some of you mentioned that also uh, manifests itself, uh, the level of how the prosecutors or the police uh, deals with NGOs on the ground. Again, I repeat what I said. There is not a single shred of doubt in the minds of any of the political um, leaders that I have, that we have, uh, heard during discussions in the Council as to who they refer to when they are uh, giving those very clear, indeed very forceful political messages about fighting smuggling. They do want and they do expect prosecutions that are targeting these networks. And I do agree with you, we don't have enough of them. And if somehow a misguided prosecutor or a misguided law enforcement officer believes that he or she is pursuing the political pressure or the political priority of, sm uh, of, of fighting smuggling by pursuing uh, individuals who are helping put showers up on a field, I think there is a big gap. So that is why we always said we need to understand more, and I do believe that we need to us at the level of the Commission foster also where we can, and we are endeavoring to do that, to foster dialogues also in the member states between the state authorities and the civil society actors, so that they actually talk to each other about these situations and sometimes maybe about the misguided way in which political priorities are being translated into activity on the ground. Because as I said, in terms of what the understanding is of what fighting smuggling should be about, there is no doubt that sm fighting smuggling should be about fighting those networks, both inside the Union, both outside the Union. And this is where following the money comes in. This is, from that point of view, we need to follow the money. Because, again, behind these phenomenon, become, behind that type of phenomenon, there is money. Um, one also element is the policing and the fear that causes uh, in the NGOs, in the civil society taxes. This is something clearly wrong. And again, we look forward to have this dialogue with the, with the civil society actors to understand how that happens and the, the, the complex, I'm sure, situations in which these uh, incidents uh, take place. Because as I said, we, do, uh, we can play a role in encouraging dialogues at the national level between the authorities and the civil society actors. Which, what I do not believe is that we can solve that by legislative action. And uh, again, that is why I said at the beginning that the solution should not come and cannot come from that because it is not what is going to produce more clarity, more predictability uh, for the organizations on the ground. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dragos. Um, will you like to, we are running just very briefly. Yeah. Thanks, Sergio. Just a reflection on the on the question, uh, fishermen in this context of smuggling and non-criminalization, and why it has not been touched upon. Just uh, to spread the word and, and to do some uh, uh, shameless app promotion of fra work, we did some research a few years back. We published a report on Euro on fundamental rights at Europe's southern uh, sea borders back in March 2013 which uh, looked into these, these issues and we, based on interviews with fishermen, we found that there, there was a concern among fishermen that if they assist irregular migrants, uh, uh, they might uh, face them as prosecution uh, for, for aiding, facilitating irregular uh, immigration. For instance, uh, based on discussions with, with the Maltese uh, uh, fishermen, uh, we found out that although there was no prosecution for transporting rescued migrants, uh, in several cases when Maltese fishing vessels wanted to 
uh, unload or disembark uh, uh, people found at sea in distress. Uh, the, the Maltese armed forces didn't allow those fishing vessels to, to uh, go uh, in, in, in Maltese uh, uh, ports. So, you know, again, the threats and, and this kind of uh, um, softer, not criminalization, but other measures to, to keep uh, uh, this phenomenon away uh, from the shores. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. Just uh, if, if you are interested, you can go online and, and you'll find also testimonies from fishermen in this report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you to all of you uh, for your comments and discussions and to, of course, for your questions, aware of the time that we need to, it's time for coffee break, uh, but really big thanks. And come back to the next panel after five minutes uh, for continuing the discussion. Thank you so much.